Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Brett Esper. I'm a partner in the Maritime Practice Group at Blank Rome, and this is the Shipping and Bank Finance Panel, a regular feature of the Capital Link Conferences. Um, so we've been living with uh, the new normal, as we'll call it, for a while. Uh, bank lending remains relatively tight. Loans are available, but mostly to strong credits on tighter terms than what we experienced during the boom years. The number of banks serving the shipping industry uh, is certainly reduced, with some of what we had called the traditional shipping banks now exiting the market. Uh, at the same time, alternative sources of financing, especially leasing, uh, have assumed a more prominent role in funding the shipping industry. Uh, but over the past year or two, the overall industry seems to be experiencing a gradual upturn, some sectors more so and at a quicker pace than others. Um, are the shipping banks also trending uh, to a more normalized operating environment? Are balance sheets growing stronger? Are write-offs lower and fewer? Is less time now spent on restructuring and more time on new loan generation? Where do things stand at the moment? And where do they seem to be heading? And what can we expect in, in 2018 and beyond? So to discuss these issues, uh, we've assembled our shipping and bank finance panel, and I'll introduce them to you now. Um, to my left here, we have uh, Amit Winolda, and uh, Amit is head of Shipping Americas at ABN AMRO. Uh, next to Amit, we have Michael Parker, uh, global industry head for shipping at City. And next to Michael, we have Martin Van Tool, who's managing director of shipping finance uh, for the Western Hemisphere at DVB Bank. And then finally on the end, uh, we have Bill Gao, who is uh, executive director of shipping at ICBC Financial Leasing. Good morning, everybody. It's, it's Good morning. Great, great to have you with us. Uh, so I'd like to start with a very general 35,000-foot question for the bankers on the panel, and that is, how would you describe the current level of commercial bank lending to the shipping industry? Uh, is it continuing to contract? Is it stabilized? Or is it recovering and expanding? And I don't mean specifically your bank, but, but uh, sort of commercial bank lending to the shipping industry generally. So why don't I start with Amit? Um, what do you think? It's uh, a good question. Uh, we actually see some banks coming back to the market, which is a positive. Uh, but we also see some of the uh, usual suspects leaving the market, right? Which is uh, difficult. Uh, so, uh, yeah, in general, uh, I would like to give a positive story and say, no, everybody's in and uh, it's back to the old days. But unfortunately, that's not the case, uh, which is a shame because we, uh, we like our partners. Uh, yeah. to work with. Uh, so it's, it, it, it is becoming more difficult or it has become more difficult for shipping, fi uh, shipping uh, companies to finance itself in a traditional way. Yeah. Well, that's, that's interesting and thank you for the candid answer. So what I take from that, it sounds like it's still contracting a bit, maybe continuing to seek stabilization. Michael, what, what do you think? Yeah, I think, I think there's another $50 billion to come out permanently. If you think from where we were a year ago, we've had DNB take 10 billion of their portfolio and put it into a sort of runoff portfolio. We've had others less publicly say they will shrink their portfolios, those, some of those that grew quite rapidly in the last few years. We've had the sale of HSH completed, or not closed yet maybe, but the, but the deal signed off a couple of weeks ago, and that's got a bad bank with it, if you like, that's going to have to be recycled. So. It's not that the banks still in the industry aren't doing new business, but I think it is some of those um, stressed, and not always stressed, but some of the portfolios where the regulators have told those banks, your portfolio is too big, uh, and where they're being encouraged by the regulators and their boards of directors to essentially find means to reduce that. Now, whether that goes into the hands of others who will then continue to recycle it, as the banks historic, have historically done, I think is, is, is maybe less likely. So that, and as Krista said in her opening remarks, that's why a lot of the new lending, and maybe it's not on the ships about to be ordered, but say five years down the road, will be much more maybe capital markets replacing what the banks have historically done. Martin? Do you agree with what you've heard? Yeah, I agree. I mean, traditional ship finance or, or ship finance from the traditional ship financiers, the European banks mostly, 
uh, Asian banks, that's definitely still on the retreat. Um, there's a, the, they're the ones that sit on losses. They have credit committees that you know have memories now of when things go bad. So they're still shrinking uh, their balance sheets. Um, it much depend on what owner category you're in, whether you feel the effect of that. I think I think the the, the, the good owners with with stronger balance sheets they don't don't feel that as much. I think they they see the contrary because there's there's a fight for quality still with banks. So everybody wants to bank them. So they they have uh, all the opportunity to pick and choose. If you're on the other side of the equation, for whatever reason, then then the shrinking is even deeper because you won't make credit committee hurdles, etc. So, so, so the, shri the shrinking yeah. in general, yes, and in in some parts of the sector, even more so than for other parts. Yeah. So, um, so where do we find the bottom? I mean, at what point do you reach equilibrium and uh, you feel like you've got a healthy balance sheet? Um, when when does that happen? Amit, how far away are we from that? That's a really good question. I think we also have uh, some new regulations which are going to hit uh, the banking industry, right, with Basel IV. And uh, some of these banks which are currently in may take a second view and you know, look at the balance sheet and say, okay, how much more capital do I need to hold to actually to sustain this business, right? And is mm -hmm. it still yielding enough return on equity for my shareholders? So, I mean, when that's going to hit, I think after that, hopefully we'll get a little bit more uh, insight into uh, who's in and who's out. Yeah. Any, uh, Michael or Martin? Uh, well, I, different perspective? I, <clears throat> we published a paper on Basel IV, which I decided not to read on the flight over yesterday because it would be too depressing. But um, Basel IV, if it was enacted, would probably kill shipping finance forever, or it would require sort of margins of 10% or whatever to meet the capital requirements. So it may not happen, of course, because one needs to look at what's happening in bank regulation here and, and, of course, in Europe. So, But it is about capital and what's driving, you know, as Martin said, some of its stress that's still not out of the system, but you know, the DNB decision from the way it was announced is a return on capital issue, and that is something which all banks are facing increasingly, and shipping has to compete for that capital. And so it really is driven by quality, if you like, risk quality, and that's what will continue, I think, to drive consolidation. So we have bigger companies in the shipping industry that, if not investment grade, or at least, you know, crossover type credits, which can attract uh, public, public unregulated capital from the capital markets. Yeah. Thank you. Bill, this leads me to you. Um, as I mentioned in my, my short opening remarks, alternative sources of financing, especially leasing, uh, have assumed a more prominent role in the funding of the shipping industry. Um, so let me just ask you generally, um, when is lease financing the right alternative for a particular uh, company? Thank you. Um, it's my pleasure to be have a chance to share about the Chinese leasing as a kind of alternative solution to the global shipping finance. Um, just based on the, I would say, some third party and the data in the 2017, um, we were told actually in the Chinese financial leasing, you know, already take about 15 percent, one five percent of the global shipping finance market. You know, we not on purpose to do that so quickly. Maybe in the, like those gentlemen mentioned about the traditional European and the banks and the kind of still, you know, shrinking in the, the traditional shipping finance. So the ship owner have to look for the no alternative -term solution and to look for the new funding. And in the meantime, I would say, since the China has the largest, I would say, the ship, shipyard capacity, so we have to step into the shipping finance market, provide the alternative solution for this, and uh, I would say, very special market. So we are growing very fast, and uh, every year, in general, not just ICBC leasing, but in general, I would say, the China leasing company keep the two digital growth every year. For example, in the last year, we did a $2 billion US dollar investment directly to the shipping owner. And uh, this year, 2018, we're planning to do another $3 billion US dollar continually. So which means in this kind of figure, we keep growing every year. Thank you, Bill. Um, just for those in the audience who haven't looked at uh, lease financing as an alternative source of funding, can you outline for us just kind of very generally what the sort of the basic terms of, uh, of a finance lease are in terms of uh, just the term of the lease and purchase options, uh, et cetera? 
Yes, and like? thanks. It's, a, it's kind of the place, and we have, I can do a little bit of advertisement about how the trend leasing and the working on. It's very similar like a, the traditional banks, so we do maybe the same way. The only thing slightly different, we can provide a little bit higher leverage. Um, you know, in a the, in the really good time, we provide all of 100% finance, so which means that you don't need to provide any money. You just uh, show your company name and give like your financial statement. We finance everything from, you know, pre-delivery until the whole ship. Um, but this kind of golden age is gone, so and it's, we have to be very carefully. But still, we are much more aggressive compared with the banks. And in terms of the, of the price or the cost, of course, and we take a higher leverage, of, which means and we also um, have to and increase our price, you know, as well. The, the big difference, and I would say it's significantly different, so and from legal perspective, for the traditional bankings, and you only need to pledge your ships to the banks. But when you do the leasing, you have to change the title, which means an ICBC leasing become like the legal ship owner for your ship. And of course, based on our the leasing agreement, so uh, when the leasing period is done, you can have the option, purchase the option, obligation to buy back the ships, or we have the option to sell our ships back to you. So you can you know take back your ships after a certain age, or we can do operation leasing, which means and after a certain age. You just walk away, and uh, we, are, we continue to keep the ship by our, by our pool, so we can do whatever we like to do. So that's kind of something different, but we are a little bit more flexible. That's why I think also, back to what I said, you know, the reason, um, the China leasing, I would say, grow that, that fast, because and it provides a much more flexible way to do the business. Bill, do you do only bareboat chartering, or do you do time chartering as well, doing a vessel operation? Uh, actually, we do both. We do also the bellboard chartering, but also we can do the time chartering. But you know, since we are still the financial institution, we are actually owned by the bank, ISBC. So we don't have like an in-house and the commercial team or technical team to over really operate the those ships. So we have to work with the third party, those big names together, and to have to you know to operate our ships on behalf of ISBC leasing. So that also provides maybe opportunity for the third party ship management company to work with us and also run our ships. Thank, thank you, Bill. Re returning now to the uh, to the bankers on the panel, um, I'd like to talk about the role of uh, uh, of the banks in the in funding the shipping industry, and and if you are contracting, sort of who's filling filling uh, the void that's left. So in the past, first priority secured debt uh, was part of the the capital structure of nearly every shipping company. I assume that's still true today, uh, but but I'll ask you if it is, and and uh, to what you know what is what is replacing it to the extent that it's it's uh, a smaller part of the capital structure than it has been in the past. And why don't, why don't I start with Martin? What does that capital structure look like, and and how has it changed with respect to bank debt? Assuming that uh, traditional bank bank finance is the cheapest form of finance, so it's always preferred. Anything that is replacing it has some kind of equity element. So it's either pure equity, you just have to come up with more money of your own, or it is, okay, let's, let's say, alternative lender that just gives you a blend between you know, what, is, what is mezzanine and equity, depending on where, where the risk appetite is, where the leverage is. So the, the academic question is, it is equity. Mm. Some sort of equity, somebody's equity has to come in, uh, because because our cheapest form of finance, the traditional ship lending, is uh, is just less. So everybody, and it's a pricing game. So everybody, and this is the big difference I think with the traditional banks where that have a hard stop at a certain risk uh, profile. They say, okay, we don't do more than sixty or seventy percent. A lot of the alternative money is able to price beyond that, say, okay, you want 65, you'll pay this, you want 70, you pay that. I mean, it's a menu, you choose. Mm -hmm. And I think that is, that is the power of that new money in, in sourcing deals that traditional banks cannot or will no longer do. Uh, it's the flexibility that is attractive. And I think we'll, we'll see more of that mm -hmm. because we sort of DVB traditionally sort of the last outpost for traditional ship lending when you do, you know, non-recourse, spot market. If we don't do it, then, you know, there's, there's a whole world out there for people that all of a sudden price it at 8 or 9 or 10. And there will be more of it because people pay for it, so it will attract more money. Do banks like yours consider 
making those kinds of loans so where the, the, the advance rate's a little higher than, than you might typically do and maybe the risk is a little higher but the return is better? Is that something that your banks undertake? Uh, no. Not anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, we, the model is changing, so say that you have a uh, alternative lender that finance through a savings bank, they may become my client because they, they finance at 80% and I may back lever them at 40 or 50% or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Let me just ask uh, the, the panel here the role of private equity. Uh, earlier in the down cycle, private equity was pretty active uh, in providing second lien debt, mezzanine debt, um, and uh, finding a, that, that place in the capital structure. And, and I think a lot of them <laughs> became disappointed lenders. Um, what is their role today? Um, my perception is they're much less active doing this. Is that accurate? Um, Amit, what do you think? Yeah, I'm not sure if they're much less active. I mean, certainly on the uh, just full out equity part, uh, we do see less, uh, which makes sense. Uh, but, uh, you know, we still see new funds uh, coming into the markets and uh, looking to invest up and down the capital structure for different prices. And exactly like Matijn said, uh, you, you know, you, you need to find them. Uh, so maybe less, uh, less prominent or less uh, out in the open, but they're definitely there. Mm -hmm. uh, but I fully agree with Matijn, by the way. Yeah? So uh, it needs to come from somewhere. Uh, you know, our bank is not taking the additional risk, uh, also not for an increased price. We price the risk uh, uh, as it is for the in the traditional way, right? So uh, m maybe even lower than 60 to 70, right? 50 to 60, I would say, depending on the underlying uh, sub-segment of the company that, that, you know, where it's in. Um, but yeah, it needs to come from somewhere. Uh, and the first question is, you know, where the equity comes from? Is it from the own companies? Uh, is it from the capital markets? Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. we'll see. Well, well, private equity has been active in acquiring some of the struggling banks. Is, is, that, a, is that a positive thing um, for, for the market? Michael, what do you, what do you think? Um, <clears throat> we'll have to see. I don't, I don't know. I, it depends what, what happens. And obviously, HSH is the one that we will see. I come, coming back to what Martin and Amit have said, the European Central Bank and the regulators around that, like Norway and UK, if you like, have clearly indicated to banks they don't want to see leverage. So you've got this 60 to 65 percent hurdle that banks are really not allowed to lend against anymore. It wasn't ever part of official policy, but it's sort of become the, uh, the word, if you like. Um, and that's really what's created the room for the alternative lenders. And the panel after this can, when they don't talk about how, how quickly that is taking shape, I think the difficulty for that is the implied cost of that on top of what banks are prepared to provide is, is, is expensive given the returns that those lenders need. Now, many of those lenders have backing from private equity or hedge funds, so they're not regulated and therefore at least don't have the costs that we, we, we banks have. But I go back to, say, 15, 20 years ago when mezzanine finance was talked about. And, and of course, it never really took off then because banks were prepared to do 80% and, and even 100%. But I think the time has now, has now come. And then, of course, those alternative lenders will also need funding. So I think there are other opportunities for the commercial banks in shipping to help in this process of recycling the capital. The question in my mind is how long they, are those alternative lenders a transition between, if you like, the banks and the capital markets? Are they going to be a permanent element in the capital structure? Uh, and is that the way that hedge funds and private equity will, will sort of stay in the business? Mm -hmm. I think as we've seen from some of the equity positions that hedge funds have, you know, they have limited terms on those funds and have to exit whether they come back in the same way recycling that capital, we'll have to see. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, let me return to Bill uh, for a minute here. Um, Bill, in terms of the, the kind of opportunities um, that, that you are most looking for, if, if there is such a thing, um, is lease financing more suitable for any particular sector of the industry or for any particular circumstances, such as new build versus second hand or um, vessel supported by a term charter as, as opposed to vessel operating in the spot market? Is there any particular circumstance or sector that you know, you uh, you think lease financing is most suited for? 
Yes, and uh, so, so far we have about over 300 ships under our ISBC portfolio. And uh, a dry bulk take about one third, another one third come from, I would say, the LNG ships. So these two sectors, I would say, you know, so far, I would say we did most of investment, or so maybe the purpose for us to come to the capital link this time, and also focus on this specific two segmentation. But otherwise, things are also during the, I would say, the previous and the pen discussion, the tanker also very interesting, the, I would say, segmentation. So we also take, uh, the, you know, into, because, you know, as I said, you know, we are the, we are the legal actual owner, so which means and uh, when the when the customers are really default, we have to take back the ships, the rental ships by ourselves. So from that perspective, we sometimes in the look forward at that more carefully compared with the traditional banks, because we sometimes have to take the risk and really become like a ship owner to operate all the ships. So that's and I would say in the you know dry bulk and the tanker so far would be the most interesting segmentation for us in the 2018 this year. Well, that's interesting. So, dry bulk. Why why dry bulk? Uh, is it just uh, expectation about uh, sort of where that sector is heading in terms of uh, recovery, or it's? I take it it's not charter cover. Um, what is it? Okay. Um, you know, we did a uh, one deal with the Valley for the Valley Max, uh, so we have the chance to really involve in the VLC. And so that's give a very good, I would say, the weight or so the position into this dry bulk market. So, and also, and we have much less, I would say, the burden or, which means we don't have much old ships. So we have so much cash on hand and so we can really invest into the dry bulk, which means we can, you know, quickly to uh, acquire maybe some new ships from, you know, the new building or from the, maybe the second hand, but, you know, some kind of new ships, which have the full fail, say, the new reg regulation maybe with the scuba and the equipped or maybe scuba ready. So we can maybe face about 2020 when the market come into this big, I would say, the, chain, the game changer, which means, and, uh, you know, we have the better position in the market to really, you know, utilize our, you know, new build ships to the final charters. So that's why I said about the dry bulk, this subsequent market. And for the tanker, the said, you know, it's more like, I would say, the dry bulk last year, in, you know, so everything looks so okay, and, but the price still low, so it also has a chance for us to step into. When I talk about the, the tanker, I'm specifically talking about the product tanker. Yeah. I'm sure you've looked at some deals and turned them down over the past year or two. Can, can you sort of describe a, a, a sort of a deal that came to you and you said no thanks? And what was it about the transaction that uh, was unattractive to you? <laughs> no names, but. <laughs> um, you know, we, as I said, you know, we, we, we did about in the two billion US dollar last year. So, and uh, some of the significant deal, and we made, you know, besides the dry bulk, I already mentioned about food. Uh, uh, Valley Max deal also we did with like a BP for the for the product tanker or some of the big and LNG ships as well with uh, some of the big players and uh, maybe people know about that or background. Um, so the typical structure we did, you know, for example, we can provide 100% finance, 100%, really 100%, uh, which means that we have to really look at for the credibility for the, I would say, the, the final user for the ships, you know, as far as they have a good and you know rating and we can take the risk really take a longer period, you know, like uh, maybe in the 20 or 20 years longer of the leasing period and the for the, also the, for the ship chartering. So that's a slightly different, very big difference compared with the traditional bank's structures. Thanks, Bill. Uh, okay, b back to the banks now. I want to look forward a little bit here and I want to ask uh, each of the banks, what is, what is your focus for 2018 and, you know, what are your strategic goals? What are you, what are you looking to accomplish in 2018? Amit, can I start with you? Sure. So if you look at uh, <clears throat> our division as a whole, which is basically uh, across the globe, seven teams, uh, we basically say uh, we grow, but we don't grow just for the purpose of growing, right? So it needs to make, uh, it needs to make sense uh, from a moderate risk profile, as we like to say ourselves. So uh, there's no contraction in any way. Uh, we'll do deals when they make sense. Uh, we're still there to support our clients. We want to be and become and stay relevant for our clients, and, and that's basically the goal. Very good. <laughs> Michael, how about you? Um, well, we've, the philosophy we've had has never really changed in, since the crisis in the mid-80s. So we're continuing to do what we can to support our clients and obviously moving with the time. So a lot of, a lot of effort now, mainly around gas, I suppose, because that's clearly a sector that is <clears throat> continuing to grow. I think the, the recovery is there. Um, obviously, from a year ago, it's not as been fast or consistent as... The, the as recovery well. is there where? Well, I think across all sectors, even, even in the offshore sector, the stirrings of recovery there and, of course, the expectation of the oil companies resuming their exploration programs. But 
what we also have to do, and, and I was struck listening to the Game Changer panel before, we've actually, I mean, I agree with Matt, no one should order any ships now, really, because the, the whole regulatory environment is, is about to change. The IMO is sticking to 2020, and the deferral on ballast water wasn't that far. This is fundamental, and more is coming. So a lot of the tonnage that is in the order book or is even operating is going to represent huge challenges for owners around investment and, and what to do. And I think for us as lenders to the industry, we're not immune from that. We are one of 16 banks that are signed up to looking at the environmental, um, our CEO signed up to this, and I know DNB and SOC Journal are also part of this, I can't remember the other banks, to the impact of environmental issues on a number of our portfolios, and that includes shipping. So the, we're all part of a trend towards uh, financing responsible environmental behavior, all those sort of things, and shipping is catching up to a number of other industries. And then, of course, there's the issue of stranded assets in the energy industry, and we, I think, have to start thinking as shipping lenders about what it is we're lending against. So I, I sort of feel we're in the finish recovering from what happened in the last 10 years, and that, I think, this year will be a, good, a strong year for that. So, so the recovery, although there are still a few tail end companies struggling. And then our focus has to be quite careful on what it is we are financing going forward. And we have to follow what's going on in the regulatory sense very, very carefully. There are opportunities around scrubbers, ballast, water treatment, but the challenges the owners face on these issues are only, only going to get stronger. And so as lenders, I think we are really part of that. And, 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 and our own management and, and boards are part of that agenda too. So we're all coming together in, in what is essentially going to be a much more regulated industry and hopefully one where you know, the IMO makes sensible decisions and is allowed to make those decisions working with the industry to make sure that the new regulation when it comes in is actually implementable and enforceable. Yeah, very good. Um, Martin, um, DVB? Yes. Listen, it's hard to disagree with Michael, so that's what well, we won't do it. It is indeed adapt and help our clients adapt mm -hmm. to, to, you know, new solvency regulation, to environmental regulation, all that. And it's, it's, it's very much uh, existing clients that, you know, need refinancing, still need some help one way or the other. That's first and foremost. We'll still onboard new clients if it's the right deal, mm -hmm. but it's adapting. Very good. Thanks. Um, we're, we're getting a little low on time. Maybe one or two more questions, and then we'll look to the audience to see if they have any questions. Um, I do have a question about um, the role of fee earning by the banks. Um, and Michael, I'll direct this to you. Um, during the boom years, the syndication fees and fees from cross-selling investment banking services and financial advisory services were a significant part of the business model for large diversified shipping banks. Um, is that a focus for your bank uh, today? I know fee generation is, but is well, <laughs> it obviously plays a smaller role, but is that something that, uh, that you're as focused on as, as perhaps you were in the past? For us, it has been certainly since 1990 when Prince Al Walid became a shareholder in the old city core. So we, when, when that's when our then chairman John Reed worked out that lending money and issuing credit cards wasn't going to be the basis to survive. So within shipping, certainly our merger with Travers Corporation in 1998, bringing Salomon Smith Barney as part of creation of Citigroup has been important because this industry is a dollar-based industry and is heading more and more towards the capital markets consolidation. So it's always been part of our philosophy. Sure. Yep. Okay, we have just a couple minutes left. I want to look out into the audience here and see if anyone out there has any questions for the panel. Okay, seeing none. Let me uh, just wrap it up here with a couple of final questions here. And I, I just want to get your perspective on sort of where we are in this recovery, Michael, that you mentioned is, is underway, and I think we all, we all sense that. Um, which sectors of the industry do you, do you feel are most advanced toward a recovery and which are sort of most challenged as we sit here today? Bill, let me start with you. 
I think uh, so far, you know, we did a lot of investment in the offshore in the past few years. So and I would say the offshore is still, I would say, the most challenging part. And uh, as I mentioned, you know, the, the dry bulk had been given the green light from our credit committee. So I would say the dry bulk also, you know, so be the more exciting segmentation so far and uh, from our perspective. Yeah. Martin, do you agree or do you see it differently? Uh, well, it's dry bulk, obviously. Yeah. We're vigilant on, uh, on tankers. Uh, traditionally, that sector behaves slightly better than, uh, than dry bulk. Uh, because of the, you know, the composition of it, but we're vigilant on that one. Yeah. Anyone have a different perspective? Anybody see a different sector as um, sort of most advanced toward recovery? Okay. Mohamed, you seem to have a No, I don't, don't think more advanced. I think uh, on the tanker side, it's actually quite an interesting uh, moment in time if you compare it to the, to the dip first quarter 16 of the tribal book, right? So, uh, I think it, it actually makes a lot of sense to, uh, to invest there, depending on the age profile. Uh, I think there's you know, still substantial uh, barriers to entry there as well. It's quite capital intense, especially the, the VLs, right? So, yeah, I, uh, I think if, if you have, the, if you have the, the capital and you can do something meaningful there, that makes a lot of sense. Michael, you've been in this industry for, for a while. Um, let me ask you, what circumstances do you think would most promote recovery of the industry over the next year or two? Or the, as Matt said, no new ships. Now, obviously, there has to be replacement tonnage. Um, and if you put on, put on one side the, the regular regulation issue I mentioned, it really is around not ordering speculatively um, and allowing the scrapping that needs to take place around old ships and in those sectors like the offshore sector, which has far too much redundant um, yeah technical redundant equipment. I think that has always been the driver of confidence. I think the other thing is to allow, you know, allow demand, assuming that trade wars don't break out, to allow demand to provide a stable recovery in earnings. What we've seen in the LNG business, is, which is, was predictable, but not all predictions come true, of course, which is that as ships were built, for projects that got delayed, uh, rates fell. Now those projects are all coming on stream. The ships are going onto them, and rates have recovered strongly. Um, LNG is a sector that's going to be interesting for one of the other reasons, which is um, LNG is a fuel. And so these are the sort of changes taking place in this industry which make it so interesting. But they never quite happen sort of fast enough. And I think what mm -hmm. owners have to do is sort of hold back a bit. They have some difficult decisions to make, and I think the lenders have to also maintain a discipline to allow right. the recovery to happen. Yes. Okay, that's going to have to be the last word. Um, I'd like to thank our panelists and uh, the audience for their attention. Thanks very much.